So for, for those who, who've not seen me speak here before, haven't met me, my name's Mark Middleton. I'm a, a medical oncologist like Pippa Corey. I'm based in Oxford. And like Pippa, I've spent my life doing clinical trials of the sort that, that she uh, showed in Manchester and in Oxford. And in, in uh, had the same experience of Pippa, of everything being revolutionized over 20 years. And it's interesting to reflect that although the whole of melanoma treatment has changed and how we look after patients has changed, we're still doing exactly the same sorts of trials as I was doing 20, 25 years ago. Uh, so I start to think about that a little bit. And then COVID strikes. And being based in Oxford, I've had a ringside seat at a very different way of doing clinical trials. Trials like recovery for COVID and panoramic where everything's done virtually or nearly everything's done virtually. Uh, and started to think about what we could do differently because one of the problems with having a relatively rare condition like melanoma is that if you want to participate in research, you are to some extent hostage to what's happening on your doorstep. You may not be well enough to travel long distances in order to access that cool new molecule, uh, and therefore the research that you get to participate in is the research that people like me choose for you. And if you go onto the NIHR website and the NCRI website, what we say is we put patients at the heart of our research. We put patients at the heart of what we do. And we don't always live it. And I'm as guilty of that as the next researcher. Uh, but I'm not saying I'm trying to make amends now. But in terms of thinking differently, uh, you know, my, my thinking on this chimed very much with Julian Newton Bishops, uh, who has led very large consortia looking at the genetics of melanoma over several decades. Uh, and the geneticists have long understood that in order to pick out those rare variations in genes that predispose to, to cancers and other conditions, you have to look across thousands and thousands of people. So they're well used to working at very, very different scales from, from what we do in the oncology community in particular. Uh, and so in collaboration with Julia and with colleagues at the Highlands and Islands and, and also at the, the, the Sanger Institute, we started to, to think about how we could come up with a clinical trial that overcame some of the difficulties uh, for patients in accessing research, depending upon where they are uh, and, and what's available on their doorstep. And my melanoma, uh, and you've got a leaflet about it here in your packs, uh, and we've got a, a, a booth outside where you can sign up or just go and ask some questions from Michael or me or from Andy who are there. Um, is our attempt to, to do something different. So the aim of my melanoma is to empower patients to take part in research without involving their carers. That's not to say I want you to stop talking to your doctors and specialist nurses and, and others, but you decide whether you take part in this research. You decide the extent to which you take part in this research. We're, we're launching it formally today. We've been running it quietly in the background with small groups of patients for about two or three months as we work out the glitches. It's a web-based system, uh, and you're invited to consent to us accessing some of your health records that the NHS holds centrally. Uh, so we can get basic information about people's tumors, about the sort of treatment that they've had, uh, and we can infer from some of, the, some of the data that tell what sort of side effects you might have had. Uh, if you're willing, you can also let us have access to whatever material your local hospital holds in, in, in the way of a sample of your tumor or a sample of blood. Uh, and further down the line, and subject to us raising the necessary funds, uh, we, we hope to be able to bring trials to your doorstep by, if we want to look at particular blood biomarkers and how they relate to something, uh, sending out packs so that you can have your blood done locally uh, and sent into a central uh, biobank facility in Milton Keynes, just down the road, uh, where it will be held for analysis. So at every step of the way, though, we're putting the power in the hands of you, the patient, to decide whether that's something with which you want to take part. We're also very interested as more and more people survive their melanoma, uh, and particularly their stage 4 melanoma, uh, 
at what cost does that come? You know, we're very focused, as, as I think Pip has eloquently shown, about getting that curve up and up and up and up and up. Perhaps slightly less focused on how we leave you up there on that plateau. You know, we just count that as the win. And you know, if we've stopped your thyroid gland from functioning or your pituitary gland from functioning or we've damaged your heart, then you know, clearly that's consequential and that matters. So we're very interested in using this to look at scale at your experience of our new treatments to understand some of the issues that apply long-term in particular. But as you'll notice that those curves tend to go out to about five or six years uh, and then stop, and that, that's partly financial uh, because it's very expensive to keep going back and tracking people all the time, uh, and partly simply about you know, there's a finite number of people who can do this, and therefore you've got to take them off that and move on to the next trial and so forth. So we, we want to address that by saying, okay, well, well, we'll come straight to you. We'll use the power of the web and of digital trials to, to ask those questions. And again, participation is entirely dictated by you. Uh, you give your consent to participation. You fill in the questionnaires online. And as well as the quality of life and what's called in our jargon patient-reported outcome measures, uh, we're also increasingly interested in other aspects of, of treatment, and in particular the burden of treatment. So you know, one of the nice things about nivolumab, pembrolizumab, and some of the immunotherapies that, that we use is that most people tolerate them pretty well. But you know, that having been said, it doesn't mean that having treatment is a walk in the park. So you know, some of the patients that are treated in Oxford you, know, you come for your hour-long infusion of nivolumab once every four weeks, every six weeks, perhaps every eight weeks in the future. Um, and that sounds great, but you, you, you've got to park in our hospital. Um, you've got to navigate the, the parsimony of our, our working processes because the drugs are expensive. We won't make it up until we've actually clapped eyes on you in the, in the building. So you've got to hang around for an hour whilst the pharmacy gets around to doing it. Uh, so that we don't waste whatever it is, three, four thousand pounds worth of drug. Uh, and you know, there's just that burden of we generally muck you about and then you know, our junior doctors go on strike and we move the day so your <laughs> childcare arrangement goes wrong. No, I, I jest, but you know, we have, leaving strikes aside, we have a thousand and one other ways in which we can mess you about so that your carefully honed arrangements back home fall apart because we've, we've changed your appointment. So we want to understand the burden of treatment, not just quality of life measures. And we also need new quality of life measures. All of, all of the trials that, that Pippa showed, all of those big trials have measured quality of life. And we use an instrument called the QLQC30, which is sort of, you'd think that you know, when Moses came down with the tablets, there was a third tablet, which was the QLQC30. And, and somebody said, you will use this and only this to measure quality of life. Um, it was developed for chemotherapy drugs in the 1970s and 80s. It's a fantastic instrument for chemotherapy drugs as given in the 1970s and 80s. It's utterly useless for immunotherapy. It's pretty rubbish for targeted therapies like the, the INIBs and, and so forth. And there's plenty of groups, you know, Andrew Furness's colleagues down at the Marsden, people in Oxford, people in Sheffield, thinking very hard about how can we do this better, how can we capture this experience better so that it's more relevant to how we design care and in improve what we can offer. So what, what my melanoma boils down to is it's a web interface. You don't, contrary to what Pippa said about the trial finder for melanoma focus, this isn't about doctors. There are no trial sites I don't know how we present it on the trial finder. It's everywhere and it's nowhere. I mean, there is a server in Oxford where the data sits because there has to be something somewhere. But you know, this is all online. You go on, you sign up to the extent to which you're willing. If our website's a bit rubbish and doesn't make sense, there's a, there's a chat function and a phone number that you can contact us and go, you don't make sense, how do I navigate this? And we'll get back to you within the week. Um, <laughs> We're, we're a shoestring operation as well. Uh, and this is open to anybody who's had a melanoma. So any experience is relevant. And what we want to do is to get 20,000 patients involved in this. Because with 20,000 patients involved, 
we're at a scale that far exceeds what we can do in formal clinical trials. And we can start to tackle a series of questions that clinical trials can't help us to answer. We can start to think we'll have enough people with rare conditions or rare side effects of treatment that we can start to ask sensible questions about that. But you know, the thing I'm most excited about this is it puts the decision to participate in the hands of patients, not doctors, so that you guys decide what you want to do. And then we want to take it one step further. So as well as you deciding whether to participate in time, we want to use this as an interactive, a two-way communication, not you just telling us stuff that we then go and analyze, but for us to say to you, well, what are the important questions? Now that we've got this group of people together, and this isn't gonna happen this year, possibly not even next, we want to get people signed up, but then we can say, well, look, we've got a thousand of you signed up who've got this particular issue. Well, we think the questions are this and that and the other, but what do you think the most important questions are? Given that we can only really do one thing, what would you prioritize? So what we want to do is to then use your experience of melanoma to tell us what the most important question is. So that if there's a limitation on what we can answer, sure, we'd love to answer everything, then you will tell us what that priority is. You will dictate how we go about making use of the information that you have given us. So you know, having spent 20 years telling people what to do, it's a sort of slightly novel experience, um, ceding that, that control. But you know, I really hope that you know, it, it's something that, you know, we, it's a bit of an experiment. We don't know whether we can get the numbers to make this work. Um, we don't know whether we can sustain the funding to make this work, but I think we're off to a really great start, and I'm very grateful to the support from Melanoma Focus, whose seed money has, has got us to where we are today with a web presence and so forth. But I think it's going to be an exciting journey. I think it's a journey that we need to take because as cancer researchers, we have to challenge ourselves far more than we have to date uh, about how we involve patients and the public in our research and make sure that the questions we answer aren't the ones that we happen to be interested in, but the ones that matter most to the people whom we serve. So that's all I wanted to say. You've got the leaflet in there. There's a QR code so you can get to our web page uh, on your device. Or if you'd like to do it hands-on with a little bit of hand-holding, then as I say, we've got a booth outside. Uh, and uh, I'm told that Michael and Andy are very friendly. Uh, if you give them coffee and a bun, they certainly are. <laughs> so thank you very much. <laughs>